I've split this presentation up into four main parts. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the Cool Sheet program is and how you get BVs out of it, uh, for, for methane emissions um, specifically. What we've been doing in terms of looking at the impact of selecting for methane, there's no point in selecting for something if you don't know what the impact will be. Um, and, and the question that was raised earlier is, how on earth do we put an economic value on a trait that at the moment doesn't seem to have a value? So we have to know what the impact is in order to think about what it might be worth and, and whether it's worth putting an e economic value on it at all. I'm going to talk a little bit about gene flow. So one of the things that John and I have been really challenged with is, okay, so if we can breed for low methane, so what? How is it accounted for? Um, and how is it recognised um, both nationally and internationally? Because it's not, if it's not recognised in our national inventory, then you know, it's, it, it's not really going to serve us um, as a trait, and, and therefore it's probably not worth doing. Um, and finally, some other methods that we've been working at. Jason alluded to one, which is rumen microbial profiles, uh, and, and some other ways we've been looking at, at, at capturing methane emissions that are um, cheap, simple, fast. We're geneticists. We know we need thousands of measures. You know, we really don't want to spend a lot of money on a phenotype. Uh, we want something that's, that's, that's rapid and, and does the job. And John's going to spend a little bit of time talking about GWP star. So everything that we've done today, we've just looked at um, from, a, from a geneticist perspective. So we've looked at how much we can mitigate um, and what the impact is on, on genetic gain, so the physical trait. So really how its value doesn't impact on that. Um, but it does impact when we start talking about calculators and John's going to talk a little bit about what we think the impact of using GWP star versus GWP 100 um, might look like. Um, so without further ado, I will get started. Uh, I'm going to do the first sort of couple of sections and then, and then John's going to take over. I don't need to introduce everyone in the room as to, to why, we're, why we're here. Um, we're here because New Zealand signed up with 192 other countries to the Paris Agreement. Um, everyone signed up to um, limit global warming. Uh, the issue we have as New Zealanders, uh, similarly to uh, countries like Ireland and, and Uruguay, who we work really closely with um, and, and with Australia, is that we have a lot of grazing livestock. Therefore, our methane inventory as a country um, has, a, has a really, really large part of enteric emissions within it. And that means that the, the, the sector has been charged with reducing um, enteric emissions. Just a little bit of update of what the alternatives are. We're always looking for alternatives, and you know, and, and we've said we only have a we have a limited amount of selection pressure. So if, if we can do something really simple to mitigate methane, that means we don't need to breed for it. Then then you know we would take that option. So the the four strategies that are being evaluated uh, evaluated globally are uh, feeding, um, inhibitory mechanisms uh, generally targeted at the rumen, vaccines, and breeding. Feeding's challenging. We know that brassicas reduce uh, methane, but it's really hard to feed them uh, at a sufficient volume in the diet to make a big difference. And obviously, you have um, diurnal and seasonal variation to cope with. So although there are options to feed to lower methane, uh, it's not something that's really been picked up hugely, um, but it's still being evaluated. In terms of inhibitors, you've probably all heard that seaweed reduces methane, tannins reduce methane. There are definitely some inhibitors out there that work. Um, delivering them in a grazing system where you don't see your animals twice a day or feed them twice a day is extremely challenging. So current developments are around things like bromoform, which look really promising, uh, and they're around delivery, delivery mechanisms, probably some form of slow-release bolus. Um, so they are there, they are being looked at. Um, they're great for feedlots uh, and probably something that will be picked up by you know, large feedlots in the States. How much impact they'll have in New Zealand, we don't know yet. It will depend on those mechanisms and what they cost. Uh, but there is investment in that space globally. Vaccines, there's a lot of investment globally in vaccines. Everybody wants a vaccine to work. Um, there's investment from um, people who would like to invest to make money from, from, from the vaccine, as well as people who want to see methane mitigation for, for other reasons. Um, we think we're about 10 years away from a vaccine. So it's coming. We don't know what consumer acceptance will be. We don't know how well it will work, but we're hopeful that it is something that will be a tool in our toolbox. And, and that brings us to breeding. Breeding is the only thing at the moment that's on the ground and has been shown to work. 
Um, so it's, it's the thing that you know, we are focused on, and obviously we're here at a genetics workshop, so if, if breeding didn't work, I probably wouldn't be talking about methane. Um, but that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about breeding for low methane. Um, cut, to the, cut to the chase, the low methane sheep, uh, we've shown that they're, they're profitable. Um, so there are uh, various impacts on, on, on productivity and, and profitability traits, but generally it's a benign trait. Uh, we don't really see much correlation in terms of methane with any other trait. And that's been really backed up by going out on farm. Uh, you saw the numbers, we've measured 22,000 sheep and seeing a range of breeding values for methane on every single farm. So it doesn't seem to be being actively selected for or against. Um, the science isn't dependent on, it, on any given metric, but we are exploring other metrics and, and John will talk about that. And, and for us really, um, it's about breeding being auditable and being included in environmental plans. So if we do breed for low methane, we, you know, we, we, we get merit for it. I've already spoken about that. So the Cool Sheep Program. The Cool Sheep Program is a program you heard about it this morning. It offsets phenotyping costs for breeders. It gives people a chance to join the scheme and have a go. It gives people a chance to um, get the, the trailer up their driveway, have their sheep measured, uh, and have a look at the BVs and evaluate what it looks like in their flock. And that's what most people have done. There aren't too many people that, have actively, that are actively using their BVs at the moment to select. Some people are. But a lot of people are just using it as a tool to measure. Because if we don't measure, we don't know and we can't evaluate. Um, breeders have to be genotyping. So this is a genomic scheme. So in order to get the trailer up your driveway and to get your sheep measured, you need to be genotyping. But obviously that genotyping is useful for, for all of your other traits. We measure a minimum of eight to 12 animals per sire. Um, there's no point in rolling up your driveway if, if the data isn't accurate. And we measure a minimum of 120 sheep and that's because it's really not worth our while coming for, for any less. The inflation on transportation and costs over the last two years have really, really hit the program hard. Um, it's really difficult to get up someone's driveway um, for um, any less than 120 sheep. And this is what we're working towards. We're working towards breeders having their animals measured, genomic prediction, them getting breeding values, and, and the breeding values come automatically through um, your bureau. So we come, we measure your sheep, um, we convert parts per million, so it's a really simple box. We convert it uh, into grams per day. Your bureau feeds that into to Enprove or SIL, and, and, and breeding values are automatically generated with the NZGE on, on a fortnightly basis. So um, breeding values in the system, and the bit that we've been working on is how does that then get plugged into MPI's calculator? So is, if you've got a RAM team that you have BVs and you've got an average BV in your RAM team, what does that look like in terms of what you get recognized for, for your environmental plan? Um, be that, you know, however the, the government decides to evaluate that. If the gains we make don't go into the inventory, then we sort of consider that we failed. It doesn't matter how good the science was. If, if we don't rec get recognition for it, then, then, then it was pointless. So the, the Cool Sheep program is, is, is really working towards getting that, you know, getting on farm, getting those BVs out and getting recognized for any gains that we make. So um, in practice, how do we get methane breeding values, what to expect on measurement day and, and what to do with it? Um, First of all, we start with an, an EOI, so, so there's a website and, and you can go in and you can put your name down and you can say, I'm interested in, me in, in measuring for methane. There's absolutely, um, you know, you're, you're not signing up to anything. What you're signing up to is you'll get a phone call. You'll get a phone call from one of us who will give you a call and see if you really mean it, do you really want to do it, when can you do it, um, and, you know, and, and, and will it work for you? And if we don't think it will work for you, then you know, we're certainly not, not going to drive up your driveway. So that's the first thing. It's, it's, it's a conversation opener. Um, then uh, this is one of the trailers. We've got three trailers, one in the North Island, one in the South Island, and one for research. Um, it weighs about three tons. It'll, it'll come up your driveway. We need water and we need power. Um, and it's really simply 12 boxes. And all we're doing is putting the sheep into a sealed unit. Um, and we've got a, a, a little monitor like you would take down a mine. It samples the gas in the unit over 50 minutes and works out exactly how much oxygen uh, um, is being used, how much CO2 is being generated, and how much methane is, is accumulating. So it's a portable accumulation chamber over that one hour. 
and we, we, we convert that to, to grams a day, and that's how, how we rank animals. It's, it's, it's a very, very simple system. Um, Jason alluded to feed intake and feed efficiency. If we look at the total gas that's being emitted in that chamber, uh, it's very closely related to uh, the, the, the amount and the level of, of feed that the animal is eating. So um, there's really good evidence that we should be able to get feed intake out of the same measures. Um, the reason that we're interested in feed intake from a methane um, perspective is we don't want to just lower methane. That would be daft. That would be just like lowering the amount of feed that an animal eats. You know, you just use smaller animals. What we want to do is lower methane per kilo of feed eaten. So we need an estimate of the, of, of, of the feed eaten and therefore to, to lower the methane. Um, gas is converted to grams per day. That's the trait we've chosen to use. Uh, data is scaled to the contemporary groups. Uh, so we measure 12 at a time and we scale the data because everything affects methane because it's a feed trait. So the time of feed affects methane, the quality of the feed, the type of feed, the level of feed. So we have to benchmark it against something. We have to scale it within the contemporary group of the sheep. Um, otherwise, we, we, you know, we just get lost in the data. Um, and, and as I've said, the breeding value is estimated um, bi-weekly um, by, the, by the guys at Beef and Lamb. And uh, you just get a methane size summary for, for flocks. And we talked about the numbers being measured, uh, and the Cool Sheep program really accelerated that. Um, you can see here, so that the colored bars, um, each, each color chunk is, is, is a flock. Um, and over the years, we've just built up more and more and more flocks as, as more people have come on board. Um, uh, but for me, the most interesting thing was that when we look at the, the phenotypes out on farm, so um, the spread of those phenotypes is, is sort of 30% below and 30% and above average. And we see the same spread almost on every farm we go to. Um, the, the big bar there with the big spread is actually the, the, the methane selection lines. Uh, the rest is, is, is commercial data. It's, it's breeders out on farms who have low and high methane animals quite happily grazing alongside each other. Um, so the BVs are an indication of how your animals compare for absolute or total methane emissions per day. We haven't yet turned out a BV for methane per unit of feed intake, and that's a really important point. So the methane emissions that you get, if you just look at them, your smallest animals will be low methane, because all you're getting at the moment is absolute methane. You're not getting methane per unit of feed intake. And that was purposeful because we add it to an index, and that index accounts for feed intake, it accounts for growth, it accounts for size. We don't want to double count. If we have a, a feed ratio trait in there, and then we try and add it to the index, we'll be double counting. So at the moment, you have a very, very simple trait, which is simply the amount of methane that your animal will emit. Um, and an animal with lower methane will have a negative breeding value, so, so, so negative is good. Um, so they don't account for feed intake or the size of the animal yet. And they're not, they're not yet included in the index. And that's because we don't have an economic value. So why, you know, what, how, how do we put it into an index and, and, and how do we think about it? So um, many people are using it in their indices. And we've given lots of people advice on how to include it in their index. And what we can offer now, for everyone who's measuring methane, we've got a set of automated outputs. So um, we're, we're at the stage, this is outside the Cool Sheep program, but uh, Jen has, um, John has worked with Focus Genetics and, uh, and, and, and Natalie Pit, uh, Pickering and um, Pavithra, and, and they've really worked at how can they take your data out and give you something meaningful. Um, so they've worked on the obvious. Uh, what does the slope of your genetic gain look like at the rate that you're selecting? Uh, what's the distribution of, of, of the BVs in, in your flock for methane? But then they've looked at if you choose an economic value ranging from zero to $200 a ton on your farm with your stock, with your selection pressure, how much genetic gain are you going to make in New Zealand maternal worth or whatever index you've chosen to use uh, versus how much gain are you going to make in, in methane emissions? Um, we mostly sit around $50 to $100 a tonne for a useful economic value to make progress. And what we're looking at is you know, making at least 80 to 90% of the progress that you would have made in the maternal worth index, but also making somewhere between 20 and 50% of, of the progress that you could make in methane. So it's that trade-off. What am I prepared to give up to make progress in methane, given that I don't actually know what the value of methane is at the moment? And where should it be for my flock? And you know, what am I prepared to do? So I think that's really important. 
that people have make individual choices um, for, for their particular breeding scheme, and, and we're working with people to do that. So BVs are expressed in grams per day for, for methane and for CO2. No one's using CO2 yet. The reason that CO2 is generated is because we know it has merit for feed intake, and we're working out how to use it. Um, and the BVs are scaled to pack emissions for a 40 kilo animal uh, that's been removed on pasture for one to four hours. So they are scaled to a standard animal. Um, but what we would like to do is express them as a percentage of a standard sheep on an international scale. So what that means is if your ram team has BVs that are an average of 90% of a standard sheep, it doesn't matter who accounts for it. It doesn't matter whether it's a national inventory, it's an international inventory, how they work it out, what numbers they use. If they change their numbers 10 times in the last year, whatever number they have, we can go along and say, well, we're emitting 90% of that, and we want a 10% reduction. So we want something that translates across any system, and we want it to be simple. So we would like your BVs to be expressed as a percentage of a standard sheep. Um, and, and that's what we've been advocating for to, um, to beef and lamb, to improve, uh, and, and to MPI. So I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is the, this is the research program. Many of you know that um, John started uh, methane selection lines a long time ago. We have uh, two flocks in Invercargill that are low methane and high methane. They're only 100 ewes, so very, very small. Uh, but they've been diverging for methane uh, for the last 15 years and continue to diverge. And we use them as, as a way to look at the differences between low and high methane at the absolute extremes. So we use them to stay many, many generations ahead using single trait selection, which is something that you could only do on a research farm. Nobody's going to do single trait selection for methane in, in any other way. And we use them to look at um, differences in performance, feed efficiency, physiology, um, and, and, and we look at the economics. And the differences we see between the lines is we've seen greater profit in the low line. They're more parasite resistant. We get a smaller adult ewe, but we get the same size lamb. Uh, we get a higher meat yield, and we get a higher wool yield. Um, so most of it has been a, a sort of a, a good news story. Um, and if we follow that through um, in terms of what the biology looks like, and I will actually, um, I'm going to go back and talk here, just, 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 to, just to look at this. If we, if we go back and look at what the biology looks like, that all makes perfect sense. So there's a microbial fermentation going on in our sheep. Um, different individuals host different rumen microbial profiles. Low methane sheep tend to tend towards a propionate dominant fermentation. Um, that means that less hydrogen is being produced, and there's less hydrogen available to produce methane, which is a waste product. So there's less waste going out the system, there's less methane being produced. Propionate uh, has a slightly different fatty acid profile. We see it come through the animal. So what we see is an animal that um, tends to lay down muscle rather than fat. So we see um, more meat yield. We don't understand the wool. We know that there's a really strong connection between the rumen and, and wool production. We don't clearly understand what the mitigating factor is and why a fermentation that's a low methane fermentation suddenly produces more wool, but, but we know that it does. And finally, John and I have been working really hard on what it looks like in terms of economic value. If we put certain selection pressure on a trait and then we look at the matrix of all of the traits that we breed for, um, given a unit of, a, of selection intensity, what happens when, when we put methane in, into the index? Uh, so the, the, the black bar is methane um, at around $35 to $40 a tonne. Uh, and what we're seeing is um, we're still getting, so, so green is that we're still getting get gain in the trade, red is that, is that the trade is starting to drop off. So at that level, we're still getting gains in all of our growth traits. Um, we're still getting grain gains in, in parasite resistance. Uh, youth fleece weight is, is gaining faster than it would because for some reason we select for wool when we select for low methane. Um, we, we have very little impact on things like fertility or productivity. Um, we're seeing methane be reduced. That's why it's uh, in, in sort of uh, uh, orangey color there, but, but, but not at the rate that we could. Um, um, and we're seeing, um, as I say, li live weights are, are, are still increasing. So 
when we look at that, we don't see anything that upsets us at around that 40 to $50 dollar ton. Um, if we put really, really high pressure on methane, then we start to see gains drop off uh, in, in the other traits, but that would be the same for, for any trait. Um, and if we put no pressure on methane, then obviously we don't see any benefit. So, so we've been working through trait by trait, genetic correlation by genetic correlation. And this stuff's the boring stuff. This, stu this is the stuff that you got, you know, we've measured tens of thousands of animals to get accurate genetic correlations. Um, and it's all condensed in, in, in one graph that's probably confusing and, and, and you know, almost meaningless. Um, but it's taken a lot of work to, to, to get here. And I want to talk about the woodlands flock. So um, there's a Coopworth-based flock down at the Woodlands Research Station. It's 750 breeding ewes. It's been going for 40 years. Uh, it's a genomics test flock. We bred for um, everything you can think of. Uh, it's the trait, it's the flock that we're flexible with. It's not a CPT. It is connected, um, but we don't have to follow rules. We can breed for whatever we like and whenever we like. And in 2017, we added methane to our index at $100 a ton. Uh, to see the impact it would have. And since 2017, we've seen a 4% drop. We haven't done anything different. We've added methane to the index, but we've still seen uh, our, our productivity um, increase uh, and, a sim and at a similar rate to what it was increasing before. So um, that's really nice to see that over six years of selection, um, you know, in our own new flock, that we're seeing methane drop and, and we're seeing productivity um, still go up. U live weight has pretty much um, stagnated. It's dropped a little bit. Body condition score has stayed about the same. There's no significant difference. Um, fat yield, again, has stagnated, but muscle yield has gone up. So that's where we're seeing those, those, those profitability gains. And we took some of the rams from this flock. It's a research flock. Uh, it's considered very soft. You know, it's got beautiful paddocks down in Invercargill. Uh, they're all nice and flat and square. It's summer safe. And we sent some of our rams up to uh, just north of us, uh, up to the Lanacos farm, the Cheviot. And what we actually saw was that the, the animals ranked the same um, on hard country as they did on soft country. So they didn't fall over. Uh, the, the, the DPG that we expected from them was, was still seen in, in the flock 2638 animals. And they ranked for methane in exactly the same as they had on flat country. And that's something that was really important to us because it's something that you know, we'd be really been challenged with. Um, and finally, John and I pulled out the data about a week ago and had a look to see what had happened in the flock since 2017 to 2024 and what would happen if we projected that forward. So this is real data. This is the annual change uh, in flock 2638 versus uh, a standard flock. And to be honest, we were a bit gobsmacked um, because I, I think we knew it was happening but we hadn't really looked at it as hard as we possibly should have in the last six months to a year. And when we actually took the trajectory that we've got, looked at absolute change by 2050, which is, of course, our benchmark, this flock is on track to make 27% reduction in methane emissions by 2050 with $50 of profit added. Um, and that's really simple, steady, just going along, going about our normal daily business adding methane in, in as a trait, still breeding for profitability, and we get there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's cumulative and we get there. I can't guarantee we'll get there. All I can say is that I'm projecting it to 2050 based on six years of data, but it's six years of, of strong, solid data. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty proud of it actually, and, and, and I would stand behind it. Um, so, so there is hope that breeding will get us, get us where we need to go um, and, and that we will end up um, putting our data into these calculators and, and meeting the targets that we've been, we've been asked to meet. Just a plug for, for Cool Sheep. Um, they are working on a RAM calculator. That means that all this work will be, will be counted. Um, and, and as I've said, um, we will be offering individual outputs for people to, to look at what the impact will be um, of, of breeding. And, and we'll be able to use things like gene flow calculators, automated Cal uh, calculators to, to, to talk to commercial producers and say, okay, these are the rams that I have. If I sell you this ram and you use it on your property in 20 years' time, this is what your lambs are going to be producing. If there is a tax, say at the Meatworks, this is what it would cost you given using this ram versus this one. Um, and people can evaluate their own enterprises and, and, and their own businesses. 
and, and we've been talking to MPI about, and, and this is going to lead into um, what John's going to talk about, we've been talking to them about what, what this would look like on a national scale. So what John and I evaluated was that about a half a percent a year change uh, for breeders, if that filtered down to the national flock, um, we'd see bugger all change for years. Uh, if they started when they did at the Cool Sheep Programme, and they listened to us, and they funded the Cool Sheep Programme, because we said to them, look, you're not going to see a change for two generations, but then watch it go. And that's certainly what we've seen in Flock 2638. We've seen that big exponential ramp up. Um, and one of the most important steps for government is that it's actually really low cost. It doesn't cost much to breed for low methane. So if we do manage to save the tons of CO2 that we think we will, just by adding it in as a trait, then it won't actually cost us an awful lot to mitigate. Uh, it certainly won't cost us you know, the, the, the billions that might be put into a vaccine. But that's a biased plug for genetics, so you should probably wipe that from any record. Um, so John's going to talk a little bit about now about the internal rate of return, because we've always looked at the rate of return for the investment, what it would cost us, what it would cost the breeder, uh, and, and what our return would be. And we saw about an 80% um, internal rate of return using GWP100, which of course we've been charged to use. Um, but we saw a greater rate of return if we, if we implemented GWP star. So we always Im implement GWP star into our calculations uh, because we think it's something that's probably going to be a, a warming equivalent. We think it's something that's probably going to be useful in, in the future. So John, I will leave you. Wake up, John, wake up, it's your turn. Yep, thanks, Suzanne. So I've... Uh, You'll have to put up because I'm not quite as lucid as uh, Suzanne on this. But, and this is a difficult topic. Okay, GWP 100 versus GWP warming equivalents. Um, and people have got quite different views on it. Now, personally, I actually um, think um, that we, people should listen to David Frame because this is being recorded, isn't it? Um, <laughs> But, but because he went to Southland Boys High School has nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, um, so the methane targets are being reviewed in the next four months by an independent panel, and no additional warming is mentioned, and that's code word for GWP star or GWP warming equivalent. GWP warming equivalent is in the IPCC AR6 as better than GWP 100, and that's the sort of science rule book that finally affects the international agreements. It just takes a long time to go through that process. And the split gas approach that New Zealand implemented partly addresses the issue. Now you notice that of the four words there, all of them are important, partly addresses the issue. And 0.33% reduction per annum is often mentioned in the press as having no additional warming. Um, this is for biogenic methane emissions, so emissions from ruminants. But if you do the calculations, it's more likely to be about between 15 and 25% decreased by 2050, because the base year is 2017, I think. And it's especially if N2O emissions are included. So I've got to do a plug now for the sheep industry. One of the really good things about the sheep industry is the N2O emissions per kilogram of dry matter eaten are a lot lower in sheep, right? And that is, we've got to play up the positives here. Um, um, so I would predict that a 50% or more of the target of 15 to 25% can be addressed by breeding. Now, that's not going as fast as you could go or anything else. Yep. Uh, it's, just, it's just saying that the, the solution will be a mix. So we've got here, what about index values for the breeding? So the current system that we've got right now can deal with this transparently. Um, but I'll just So... Um, but there's a piece here that's missing in the conversations that pe people have. And that is, when you breed, you are not looking at the average cost of change or the average cost of the emissions. 
you are looking at the marginal cost or benefit of that change in the profit terms. And in GWP star or warming equivalent, the average is four times lower than GWP 100, right? So everybody says, oh, that means I only get, get a quarter of the tax bill. But the marginal cost of change is four times higher than what it is currently. Four times higher, right? So if you increase your emissions, you would get four times what you would get with GWP 100. If you reduce it by a percent, you get four times the benefit. And that's something that is completely missing from the public conversation. So what are we going to do? Well, we can't really guess what what we should do. My personal thing is, is you should use the desired gains approach and say, look, things are going to change. Breeding's a long-term uh, uh, game. We, we should aim to make about a half a percent per year reduction. That's going to make a major, major impact. Um, it probably means that we'll be adding no additional warming. Let's get on with it. But there is one other point that we need to make. The response that you'll get depends on the accuracies of your methane BVs and your feed intake BVs. Now, I'm going to skip over this. Ooh. Yeah, this slide here. So the BV accuracy for methane is important to make progress, and can it be improved? So the, the response, these are complex graphs, but all I really want to say is, is if you have high accuracy methane BVs, you will make more progress at less cost to your production change. So you should be looking to try and estimate the best methane ac accuracy BVs that you can. And so that has implications that are sort of slid around at the minute. Like if you use a lot of ram lambs, you probably should have them measured for methane or um, some proxy before you do the selection. You have to use genomics because that increases the accuracy. That increases the amount of speed you can make in methane while reducing the cost in the gain in production traits. And I think um, back to you, is it, or do you want me to quickly whiz over these? Oh, we've got only got a couple of minutes. So, um, <laughs> Suzanne and others at AgriSearch have been looking at a lot of proxies. So there's PAC, there's looking at the rumen microbes, looking at the volatile fatty acids that are produced, looking at the fatty acids in milk, and looking at um, the infrared profiles or mid-infrared profiles in milk. All of these are heritable. All of them are correlated with the PAC measurements, which is the methane measurements, both genetically and to a lesser extent phenotypically. You can use all of these. The ideal thing that everybody talks about is, is could you just do a, a swab of the mouth and do the prediction? We're working on that. But signs are reasonable, but we're just working on that. So all of these things have a cost but they also have an impact on how easy it is to measure them and when you can measure them. And if we can increase the accuracies of the breeding values, that has a direct impact on the progress that you're going to make. That's it. Yep. Uh, th th that's a bit of the response in the selection lines, and it, it's not quite clear. Um, it's not quite clear. Um, um, John, can you just repeat the question? Oh, uh, uh, the question is is about parasite resistance in methane. Um, it, it's pretty obvious that if an animal is heavily parasitized, um, its ability to process food is compromised, right? The flow rate through the rumen and a whole lot of other things is compromised. And that probably tends towards, uh, or could tend towards 
are more acetate being produced uh, because of retention time in the rumen and that will lead to more methane being emitted per kilogram of dry matter eaten. Um, but we, we, we don't play too much on that, you get what I mean? Measure the trait, measure, measure parasite resistance, measure methane. been a bunch of other sort of, I guess, comments floating around about antagonistic traits and trade-offs, but what your table showed is that there isn't really, so, so what are these people actually talking about? Uh, well, I'm going to go back to, to this table because a good table has, has a bunch of lies in it as well as, as, <laughs> as a bunch of truth, right? This is the table you're talking about, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll do, do this one. This is re these are real results, right? The crux of this is if New Zealand breeders were doing the right thing, they could be making faster progress for their production traits than they currently are and reduce methane, right? But the breeders in New Zealand are probably only making about 50% of the progress that they could be making. Right? If they fully adopted genomics, if they fully adopted measurement, they could be making a lot faster progress. I don't think anybody can grizzle about uh, the impact of including methane if they are not producing at least 80 or 90 percent of the potential genetic gain. Right? The industry could lift its gain and include methane. And it probably would get feed efficiency for uh, on the way past, and that would be an additional benefit, <laughs> right? So, I've, I better stop. <laughs> old, old grumpy man here. National scale. National scale. Yep. Thanks very much.